What's going on guys? Welcome back to Watch With Us. My name is Anthony Kozlowski and I'm here with John Keel. What's going on guys? Welcome back. Uh, as always, we're here in Watch Gauge headquarters and as we normally do, uh, what is the topic? You know, we sit and we talk, hey, all right, we could talk about these things, that thing's the other. Today's topic, we're going to talk about actually a friend of mine um, in the micro brand space, Sergio from Direnzo Watches. So kind of to kick it off, I mean, Anthony and I were talking, we brought up different topics of what's going on in the industry, and I mentioned Dorenzo's Kickstarter that went off this week. And Incredible. <laughs> I, 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 when you told me it, I couldn't believe it. He wasn't really aware. You know, Anthony's kind of immersed in the high end, day in and day out. I'm kind of immersed in the micro brand right. these days, day in and day out. So for those of you who aren't aware, Dorenzo is a micro brand. They had uh, a successful Kickstarter about two years ago in the DRZ01 which was a great watch, did all right. Last year, he killed it with the DR02, which is that piece that you were looking at on my right, desk before. Yeah. Uh, really fantastic watch, cushion shape, sandwich style, the whole bit. So recently, Sergio has been sending around prototypes of the DRZ03, which is a round die version of his watch, and launched on Kickstarter this past week. I believe it was Wednesday. He was, his goal was about $21,000 in the first minute they funded. One minute. One minute, literally within 60 seconds, funded the 20,000 and change. And here we are five days later and they're at $290,000. <laughs> um, so successful Kickstarter to yeah, say the yeah, least. Yeah, I, I would imagine he's happy, but maybe a little bit stressed out. I would think a little <laughs> bit stressed out as well. So it's funny because, you know, we talk about a lot, we talk about, you know, whether it be not being able to get certain Rolexes or certain right. Omegas and, you know, that, that creating supply and demand. And don't get me wrong, I am super stoked for Sergio. But then I had another thought that Anthony and I were talking about. And it was really kind of creating that scarcity, creating that rarity. Right. That instead of having one monstrous delivery of a campaign and delivering 1,300 watches or whatever it turns out to be, you know, I think it's cool for a new brand also to maybe launch in a different way. Right, right. I mean, well, you're a little bit more familiar with Kickstarter, but you had some some ideas where maybe without getting that large assortment of orders right off the bat, it could be probably a bit more beneficial to do it a different way. To Yeah, so I always use uh, Halios as a good example of micro brands. If, if, you know, for those of you not familiar with Halios, you know, Jason from Halios, He'll introduce 100 watches or 200 watches. He'll promote them for two weeks on his website and on his social. He'll open up the orders on a particular day and time and they're all gone within minutes. And the reason being is because he created that kind of, I, I, you know, I like to look at it as the Rolex Submariner right. kind of thing where it's, you know, you create everybody wanting them, they're gone right away and then all of a sudden guys are like, oh, I missed out. So then they're following the campaigns, right, they're following right. the social media, the Instagram. And as soon as that next model comes out, boom, they're they're waiting at their website. To, right. To There's like a, not a cult following to it, but they, they, they follow the brand. They like it and they keep up to date with the new models that come out. And they get FOMO. They get fear of missing out. Right. You know, they get the fear of, well, gee, you know, I missed out on the last one, so I want to get the, right. you know, on this one. So we were just talking about, and this doesn't apply to Sergio or to any other micro brand or any other Kickstarter, but if I were to do something, mm -hmm. I would promote it the same way going into it, you know, because right. obviously Sergio promoted it in an amazing way where he did have that support right away. But if you promote it the same exact way, but instead of doing a Kickstarter where you open it up and you just make all available orders open to everybody, what if you said, you know what, I made 300 pieces, I made 100 in black, mm -hmm. 100 in blue, and 100 in white or whatever the right. case may be. And then you can kind of budget it out and know the time frame that's going to take you to make those models because yeah. you already have a set number where with this I would imagine it, I mean, how long would something like this take to deliver that many well, pieces? I mean, you know, looking at another Kickstarter campaign, I don't follow Kickstarter all that much. What I do follow is the micro brands and the ones that do have these monstrous Kickstarters. I tune in to, 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 the them, mm. to them then. And there was one that happened within the last year. A uh, good buddy of mine, I'm not going to say the name, probably the most successful Kickstarter campaign that I can think of. And he's, I think he did sell 14 or 1500 watches on Kickstarter. Wow. The challenge therein lies was now there were delivery de delays um, from the factory because they weren't planning on that sort of right. volume. Um, 
at the end of the day, when he does get all of these watches, he's got to logistically box, you know, he has to assemble, even if it's not the watch itself, he's assembling the straps and the packaging and this and that and the other. And then, then he's got to actually logistically mail them out to 1,300 people, right. which A, is not cheap. No. And B, is very time consuming. Extremely. Uh, so the thought would be, you know, if you, if you issued the same marketing campaign, you issued a finite number of watches, and everybody missed out on them, mm -hmm. except for the lucky first 300. Sure. Then all of a sudden you have another run in production, you've mm -hmm. got people waiting about it, and people talking about it, getting ready for the next production I run. I think we can all agree that demand is extremely important, and not yeah. a saturation of the market. I'm not saying that this is a saturation, no, because these are placed not even orders, a little, yeah. but when you go ahead and put a cap on a certain amount of watches, and you don't get it, you are on the lookout and you will be following the brand. So when you do the next drop or right. the next release, you'll be likely to place that order. But then there's also another downside. First of all, if you, there's a downside to the way we're talking about it. Because mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, if we say we had to do 300 watchers, 100 of each color, what if the marketing campaign isn't as good as you thought it was gonna be? Right. What if, what if your design wasn't as good as you thought it was gonna be? Mm -hmm. In this case, I, I, I've seen these prototypes and I can mm -hmm. tell you I love this watch, um, but, there are also guys out there who come up with a design, they mm -hmm. try to do exactly what I'm suggesting that somebody might do, but then, you know, they have to worry about how to fund it at that point. Because right. Kickstarter funds the production. Right. That's really the shtick with mm -hmm. Kickstarter, right? Like if I want to create, you know, a mouse, a special mouse, and it's gonna cost me $25,000 to produce a certain amount of them, mm -hmm. you know, if it goes on Kickstarter and it doesn't get funded, I don't lose anything other than right. some, a couple of dollars and some time. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I self-funded that and laid out the thirty thousand, then they don't sell. Right. There's a bigger risk. So right. it's it's kind of up and down. I One mean, of, you you kind of have to. I'm sure anyone that's putting out a product is going to be confident in it, but you know, it's like anything else. You got you got to be take the risk. Yeah. And and I think if you're going to be doing it not through Kickstarter, it's going to be a bigger risk, but perhaps could be a bigger reward. Yeah. And the look, I mean. At the end of the day, for Sergio, good on you, buddy. I mean, huge <laughs> Kickstarter, huge funding. Mm -hmm. I think 535 backers, so at least 535 watches are being made in this run. And this is only five days into it. Right. I think he's got another 25 days or so. Yeah, I mean, every I, I don't go on Kickstarter too much, but I have in the past. And it feels like there's hundreds of kickstarting watches every every week and it's kind yeah. of hard to it's, keep up to date of what what's going to be good but this one was obviously well done well received and yeah. he had the right business plan well, in terms of getting it to people to view it and review I also it. I also think that he because of his past two prior successful kickstarter mm -hmm. campaigns he had the right contacts with the YouTubers with sure. the Instagrammers to get the reviews out there and things like that so I think he did an amazing job and uh, it's just uh, it's an interesting world we're living in and you know, that kind of segues into that whole availability thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're, we'll use the example of almost probably every video we ever do, but you look at some of these Rolexes right. or, the, or the Protect Nautilus, Nautilus where, you know, if you can't get it, you want it more and you'll pay more and, and you know, so it's, on and so forth. It's frustrating because you get a client that will come in and have the money, whether it's 10000 or $30,000, and they want to spend it and you can't get it to them. And then they get offended because they are they don't understand it's a lot of money. Why don't you have the product for them to spend $30,000 right. on a watch? Right. So then you have to kind of explain how rare they are and they're going for this amount of money on the secondary market and there's not enough to go around. But I think that's where people are starting to kind of look at other brands because they're getting frustrated with, you know, the top two brands, top three brands, if you include Odemar, you know, you can't get these stainless steel products. Right. So there, there's such a demand there, but, you know, going back to micro brands, I think that's why they're thriving right now. Yeah. Because so often I think that the big brands are putting out a watch that's, uh, you know, stainless steel, ceramic bezel, uh, sapphire crystal, automatic movement. And those are, those are, materials that you want in a in a luxury watch 100%. but most luxury watch you're spending in excess of four five six thousand right. dollars or more and these micro brands are using those same materials for, and and you're not necessarily paying for the advertising for it right. so you're able to get it for maybe four hundred dollars yeah i mean you know the bulk of the more successful micro brands that i that i have seen that I deal with, you know, anywhere from three hundred and fifty dollars, like mm -hmm. in the uh, Drakken Tugela. Sure. You know, it's uh, three hundred and fifty dollars 
bang up job, unbelievable watch for three hundred fifty dollars, and then up to about eight or nine hundred and some sure. of the other brands. You know, but for under a thousand dollars, you get a watch that, in my opinion, arguably is as good as uh, a four thousand dollar luxury watch. I mean, the biggest difference really is the movement. Mm -hmm. You know, the, most of the micro brands either use a Seiko NH35, which is a fantastic workhorse of a movement, or they use the Miyota, uh, Miyota 9 series sure. mostly. Now, the funny thing is with the Miyota 9 series, I find them to be much more reliable and uh, have a better timekeeping mm. than let's say an entry level ETA. Sure, sure. I think what people don't understand, or maybe some do, but there's levels to an ETA movement or a Salida yes. movement. So I mean, just because it's a Swiss ETA movement doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be, you know, keeping uh, a certified chronometer standards right. minus four plus six or something like that. You know, there's the, there's levels to it. So just because you're buying a product with an ETA movement, you know, a Miyota movement could easily outperform it in terms of accuracy. Yeah, yeah, and just reliability. You know, I mean, uh, one one particular watch that I carried on watch gauge for a long time, or I shouldn't say a long time, for a short while, had a Swiss movement and had a far higher defect rate than mm -hmm. anything else uh, with a Japanese movement. So, you know, it's there's there's ways to look at that. And then one thing I want to kind of get in on a little bit, which I didn't even discuss with you before we got on camera, is you have some brands that are like the Rolex and Patek, and, and then you have a lot of other brands that, you know, you go online, you can find them at 35, 45% off, right? Absolutely. I'm finding with some brands, there's a bit of both, meaning um, Omega, mm -hmm. right? I'm a huge fan of Omega. I know you're a huge fan of Omega. I've owned a few of them. One of my favorite personal watches is my Speedmaster. Mm -hmm. um, I had a client call me or a, a, a client who's become a buddy and said, hey, I'm looking for an Omega. And in that case, I said, sure, I have some Omega friends. I'll put you guys in touch yeah. and make it happen. He wanted this particular new issue that came out, the uh, James Bond piece. Mm, right. And I ended up calling four or five of my friends who are Omega retailers, mm -hmm. and everyone was like, oh, well, I'm only getting one and it's already spoken for. I'm getting right. three and they're all already sold. Um, but then you look at some of their other collection, you could find them online for a stupid you know, discount. Th there's a few brands out there that are, that are having the same issue. Uh, for instance, a brand I know very well, I worked for them for a long time, was Breitling. Yeah. Most of these pieces can be found heavily discounted on the secondary market, and yet they did the Navitimer 806 uh, re-release, yeah, the reissue. Watch. You cannot get these you can't pieces. Touch it. They we um, you cannot get these pieces, and if you go ahead and try and get one, most retailers are only getting one, maybe right. two, and they're all pre-sold. Right. So this leads back to something. I mean. Years ago, uh, I used to write for Quill and Pad on occasion, uh, not as a job or anything like that. I just did it more for fun. But one of the articles I wrote was on the dynamic of the gray market. What is the gray market? Why does it exist? How does it how does it operate? And then I gave my personal opinions on. I think it's really awful for the industry. Personally, I really mm -hmm. do. And one of the problems with a lot of these brands that you'll find all over the gray market is that they over manufacture mm -hmm. and they under market or they under deliver um so they 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 make all of these particular watches let's say they make a, a brand makes a million watches in a year they know they have the they have the analytics to prove they could sell six hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. why are you making a million watches right, so at the right. end of the year they're going and dumping them on the gray market now every brand every brand manager every brand owner Everybody on the back end and the wholesale side is going to say, oh, yeah, no, those are only on the gray market because, you know, we had a retailer go out of business yeah. in, in <laughs> you know, Tuck 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 Canada, you know, or, or whatever it may be. And that's why they're on the Internet. No, no, there's far too many out there for it to be, you know, supplied by a, any retailer going out of business right. or even any distributor going out of business. They're fed directly by the brands themselves. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, what I'm really, really, really hopeful for, in the case of Breitling, in the case of Omega, with these particular models that retailers can't get enough of, clients are paying full list for, and that are very limited, is that they're finally testing the waters to see if that's the distribution model. Well, I think um, if you look at the new Omega, the Caliber 321 that they're coming out with, it's a very expensive new Speedmaster. It's a yeah. recreation of the original Caliber. Yeah. It's going to be $14,000. Okay. But they went ahead and said, 
they're only going to be able to make around a thousand pieces or so. Right. I could be off on the number, but it's going to be a very limited production because each movement is going to be hand assembled by one watchmaker at a time. And what I think, I don't know if this is necessarily the case of why it's going to take that long, but this is their reasoning behind it. And what I think this is going to do is going to create such a demand for this watch, mm -hmm. and it's going to be similar to what Rolex did with the Daytona. Daytona has always been extremely popular and very hard to get. And then you kind of, you can't get that, you give up on that, you go to the next model, yeah. which is like a Blue Sky Dweller, then a, a GMT Master 2, and now it's Submariners, and now it's even Date Just 41s, and I think that... <laughs> when the Date Just is getting hot, that's... that's You can't find them. You I, cannot I, find a steel Date Just. I personally, I find that hysterical, and that, right. no offense to anybody who's a Date Just fan no, or owns no. them or wants one. To me personally, I mean, I I, I wasn't able to give away Datejust right. when I was in right. the... Right, that was one that, of the few the... Rolex pieces that was always discounted. Yeah. Now full retail for so, a day just. And I think what you're gonna see now is it, this could uh, transition into Omega where, okay, I can't get the caliber 321. I'm gonna right. get uh, a professional. And right. then those are gonna become a bit more scarce. And I think people Hopefully. are starting to realize it's not about purposely putting back the, the pieces and, and cutting supply, but making them a little bit more rare to kind of create that demand. And, and it will help the rest of the brand as well. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's, it is simple economics. I mean, when I took economics in high school, when I took economics in college, it comes down to supply and demand. When you have an abundance of something, people aren't so willing to pay more for them right. or to, you know, to make it the next hot thing. When you create this, even if it's an illusion <clears throat> of, well, gee, if you don't get it now, you're not going to be able to get it. Or right. I can't get it at all, so I <laughs> want it more. Sure. You know, so if if Omega, if Breitling, and a lot of these other brands can come out, I mean, look at look at Zodiac, right? right. I think what Zodiac is doing right now mm -hmm. is absolutely brilliant. Zodiac, they're, a, they're owned by the Fossil Group. Mm -hmm. They're owned by a big, huge entity with billions of dollars. They have the ability to come out and make a million watches a year. But what they're doing is they're saying, okay, we're going to make this particular Super Sea Wolf 53, whatever mm -hmm. it is, and we're going to do 100 pieces. What big brand does 100 pieces? But when you look on the tail end of that, after that 100 piece mm -hmm. comes out, all of the Instagrammers, all of the bloggers, all the YouTubes are, YouTubers are writing and talking about that particular piece, <laughs> and then it's causing sales of the rest of the collection. 100%. And I think, I think if any bigger brand is to be looking at how do we run this show, you know, how do we how do we become a desirable watch brand? But without you know, without having to say, okay, we want to be the next Rolex, which everybody at some point says, well that's what we want to do. Right. You know, and Patek and Audemars and Rolex are the ones who did it. That's it. Mm -hmm. You know, but for them to become the next thing to look at, maybe you should look at what Zodiac's doing. I think it should be a thing of the past making a limited edition of two thousand, three thousand pieces. That is not a limited edition. It's not. I mean, those pieces can always be found and I understand, you know, I think Omega does uh, pretty high releases with the James Bond watch. That has kind of a cult following, and those do sell out, but for the most part... Yeah. And uh, even, even at that point, I wouldn't call it a limited edition of X amount of number of pieces, but I'd call it a special edition, right? right? Where it, it's going to be offered for this amount of time. Now, Omega might say, we're going to make 5,000, mm -hmm. we're going to make 2,000, whatever it may be, but do it on the back end. Don't advertise it that way. Just say it's a special release for this particular James Bond. Once they're gone, they're gone. Mm -hmm. To me, that's even more appealing than right. having, oh, it's one of 2,000 pieces. Right. Because nobody knows how many they made. They might have made... 2,000 007. Right. Yeah, 2007, <laughs> right. Or 2020, because right. that's this year. Whatever right. it may be. Yeah, so it's all about creating that scarcity. And, I mean, again, let's let's bring it right back to the beginning of the conversation. I look at somebody like Jason Lamb from Halios. I look at somebody um, <clears throat> like from, from like Visitor Watch Company, which is another micro brand. Mm -hmm. They market the crap out of it as if they're going to sell 500 or a thousand they make a hundred they sell and next thing you know you know you go on the secondary market for a halio c fourth in that baby blue right. and that thing's going for you know 50 percent or double what list price was i've noticed a lot of the micro brands i mean and, and we're gonna we can end up making this video two hours long yeah, well, we can just go into so many different topics but i've noticed a lot of micro brands they tend to hold their value they hold their value pretty are, well yeah. compared to like the luxury market where some of these pieces take a 60% hit. Well, you know what I, we, my theory behind that real quick, and I'll, I'll keep this one short. My theory is, all right, I'm wearing uh, an NTH Nazario Swirl, all right? This watch we did 25 pieces of. So there's legit 25 in the world. Mm -hmm. We just re-released another 25. Now, is it a limited edition? No. But when I released the first 25 a year and a half ago, they sold out immediately. 
Like when I mean before I got them, they were sold. 25 pieces. 25 that's pieces. Nothing. The reason we made 25 more is because people email me. I get two, three, four, five emails a month. Mm -hmm. When are you going to do another Nazario Suaro? So I keep their names and I say, hey, would you like to go on a waiting list in case we do another run? Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. I get another 25 made and they sell out. But at the end of the day, if somebody sees this and somebody wants this in two months from now, I'm not going to have them new. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to resort to the... Right. And, and it's funny because with NTH, with some of these models that we've done, you know, you go on the secondary market, they're going for $100, $200 more than the mm -hmm. original retail price. You know? I think it's important to, to not necessarily go the Rolex route where you can't really deliver any pieces, but I think it's important for a brand to have a, a select few pieces that are they, harder to get, that harder they to don't make. don't overproduce. Exactly. And yeah. it will transition into more sales for the company and it makes the buyer a little bit more comfortable in buying the product knowing that it's not going to take a huge hit on the secondary market. Right. I mean, nobody wants to lose money, but, and, and look, I'll never tell people to buy a watch as an investment. There are very, very mm -hmm. few watches you can look at as an investment, but you know, when you're buying a watch, you know, you, you don't want to be like a car where you drive it off the lot and it's worth 60% of what right. you paid for it. But you want to know that what you're buying has some value retention. Right. You know, I mentioned it on a video with Rob. I've got a Speedmaster up there on my shelf that, you know, for years that thing was on the secondary market for three grand. Mm -hmm. Now it's going for 10. Right. Right. If I had purchased it, which I didn't, it was a gift. But if I did, it would have been one hell of an investment. Right. But I wouldn't have bought it as an investment. Mm -hmm. I would have bought it because I like the watch. Hopefully I didn't get my teeth kicked in if I ever right. wanted to do anything with it. Uh, and that's the way you go with watches. I mean, I'll make one prediction. Uh, I think it was the first time I'm saying it publicly live. We're here on Long Island. We're immersed in a pretty big scene of micro breweries. Mm -hmm. And in the last, I mean, it's been going on for about 20 years. Started right. with Blue Point Brewery mm -hmm. right, right down the road. And in the last five years or so, micro breweries have been getting bought by major breweries. Like, so Anheuser Busch purchased Blue Point Brewery oh. a couple years ago for millions and millions of dollars. My prediction is in the next five to 10 years, micro brands will start getting purchased by big brands. And uh, yeah, that's that's just a prediction. I could see that. Yeah, MVM, M MVMT was just purchased by Movado in the last year. Okay. Right, yeah. so for millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And granted, they're not really technically a micro brand, but I guess you really, they started with two guys right. and a design. So they started as a micro brand. Even the luxury brands, technically, at one point, were, I guess, a micro brand. Everyone, right? right? Yeah, like Breguet was a <laughs> micro brand. Because right, right, right. Abraham was sitting there yeah. making those watches, wanted to clip. Right, right. Yeah, so. No Kickstarter, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knows? Maybe yeah. he just went around his, uh, with a bell in his, uh, right, right. In his village <laughs> collecting money. Uh, so, yeah, let's let's kill it at that. Nice, yeah. nice length here. I think some 20 some odd minutes. Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of different topics, but kind of all. Uh, yeah. It's going to be hard to title this one. Right. Yeah, wasn't... <laughs> They're all connected in one way or the other, but. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you enjoy the video, don't forget to give us a thumbs up. And if you have any comments or questions about the video, please leave them down below. We appreciate you guys watching and subbing. Yeah, uh, and yeah subscribe. Yeah. Follow us on Instagram. Ricardo does an amazing job with that Instagram channel. And uh, and I think we have a giveaway coming up pretty yeah, soon. Yeah, pretty yeah, pretty excited so for that. So next, stay tuned. Uh, what day? In, in the next two weeks from this video going live, we will be announcing a new giveaway. So uh, stay tuned. Stay close. Yep. Uh, right, sub, the whole bit. And we'll talk to you guys soon. Take care. Bye.